The saga surrounding the announcement and eventual release of the Final Fantasy VII Remake meant that receiving code from Square Enix and seeing it on my PS4 home screen was a bit of a surreal experience. It's easy to forget that this thing was announced almost half a decade ago at Sony's now legendary 2015 E3 press conference, and over those years the news surrounding it saw fan excitement briefly turn to fury when they found out that this reimagining of their beloved childhood classic would be released episodically. It saw worry set in as people wondered whether it would ever actually see release given its turbulent development. As time went on and very little concrete information about it came out, the monumental nature of that task of rebuilding Final Fantasy VII from the ground up began to become a little clearer. At points it looked like it was developing the same kind of mythical quality as the other games revealed at that same press conference. And then, years later, came that demo. Completely atypical of titles suffering major issues during their creation, this didn't seem like a troubled project Square wanted to slip under the radar. This was a fierce show of confidence from a developer resolute in giving fans the experience they truly wanted. Final Fantasy VII was always something of a cultural touchstone to me, I recognised its importance, but I never gained the truly die-hard appreciation for it of my peers. This, on the other hand, had me completely hooked. As someone who grew grew up thinking the intro cutscenes of these older titles were the peak of graphical fidelity in games, seamlessly transitioning from that glorious shot of Midgar, triumphant orchestral swells and all, right into gameplay that looked as good as what I had just watched, I have to admit it totally set off that childlike pang of, holy moly, you're saying I can play one of these things now? The visual fireworks, the technical prowess dripping from every frame of this thing was tantalising, as I realised I was in for a delightfully excessive AAA experience, and what's more, that cinematic flair didn't get in the way of the battles I encountered here. It actually served to elevate one of the most exhilarating combat systems I've come across in an RPG. Needless to say, all of this had me super excited. This was set to be my game of the goddamn year. And now, after 30 hours with the full thing, was that excitement warranted? Honestly, I don't know, maybe? To talk about this thing in those kinds of terms doesn't really do justice to how confused it left me as those credits rolled. Not in terms of following the narrative, I mean it seems impossible not to have a cursory knowledge of how this stuff works by now, or the broader idea of whether I liked it or not. To be clear, there's plenty I liked and plenty I didn't, but the issue is that even after having played this very full game to completion, I'm still no more confident in its future. There are still so many questions fresh in my mind about if we will ever get to play a full Final Fantasy VII Remake. Because make no mistake, this is a starting point. One of the most exhaustedly fleshed out starting points one could imagine, but a starting point nonetheless. Frankly, to call this the remake with zero qualifiers attached is absolutely nuts in my opinion. I was aware the game would be episodic, but I don't think I was ready for just how little of the Seven storyline this thing would cover. Events that happen hour one in the original take ten hours to appear here. I've seen people theorise that this would be a trilogy, but I really think that's vastly underestimating things here. Put it this way, if Square continues this pace, stretching things out, elaborating on events and scenes and characters the way they do here, to the level of excruciating technical detail on show, it will be years, potentially spanning multiple console generations beyond this one before this remake is complete. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In more immediate terms, I know a lot of people are praising the hell out of this game right now, but for me, and this is just my personal opinion, it was slightly more of a mixed bag, with emotions ranging from I can't believe I get to play this in a game to I can't believe the game is making me play this. That intro remains as explosive as ever for sure, but I don't think it's a momentum the game can maintain. Nor would you particularly want it to, mind. A 30 hour game as full on as that would become exhausting, but I'm not sure the alternative on offer here is necessarily preferable. That alternative, while utilising scenarios and characters people have built up an incredible affection for, still succumbs to a lot of the design choices people have severely disliked about other, less typical Final Fantasies. Obviously you'll have that wild initial reaction people have to seeing this stuff in such glorious fidelity, and I feel the need to reiterate how astounding a technical feat this game actually is, it might be one of the best looking games I've ever played, but at this stage I'm way more interested to see what fans and newcomers alike actually think of all of this once that hype settles a little bit. 
don't get me wrong, there is a lot to like here. Like that combat system, oh my god. For context, I don't tend to enjoy turn-based battle systems. I think they can often appear as silly and plodding as they are tactical. But simply by injecting a little immediacy into proceedings, Remake solves all of those problems and then some, maintaining a fluid, balletic quality that rivals the combat of 15, for example, except, you know, you actually get full control over that valley. There is a lot to manage at any given moment, not simply the immediate concerns posed to you and your buddies in terms of attacking, dodging and blocking, but thanks to the ATB gauge and the ability to switch characters at any point, your brain is constantly engaged trying to figure out the best path forward. You might not literally be moving in set turns, but you are very often trying to think a few moves ahead of your opponents. You can't simply spam healing items like you could in 15, because to do so requires that ATB gauge, which also costs you the chance to unleash a more powerful attack, which could very well turn the tide of an entire battle. Given how quickly your health can drain, you're forced to consider whether it's even a good idea to heal, or simply to manoeuvre yourself more effectively to avoid damage in the first place. Crucially, these types of decisions ensure that fights retain the urgency of an actual fight here, a test of your own skill. If you miss a sword swing, it's not because some random dice roll deemed it so, it's because you didn't position yourself correctly. This isn't a scenario where a hugely tense scene devolves into a bunch of characters awkwardly standing around waiting for someone to attack. It's an explosion of flying swords and fists and bullets, of particles and numbers, all of which you have to very quickly make sense of and act on. It can feel overwhelming a lot of the time, but this also means that when you get into a good flow and you successfully manage that chaos, man, there really is so little like it. Some OG fans may dislike the changes here, but for me, with my aforementioned bias, this is unquestionably a vast improvement on the original. I just found myself, at multiple points, wishing that this system was more of a focus than it was during my otherwise lengthy, remarkably linear travels. See, for all the agency you're afforded during combat, when it comes to the majority of the rest of your time with Remake, you're uh, navigating a lot of straight, narrow corridors here. Someone will be walking ahead with you following very slowly behind, there are instances where your control will last mere seconds between long cutscenes, finicky, lengthy animations mean that minigames, set pieces, held the act of pulling a lever or moving through the game's multiple narrow passageways that Cloud could totally walk through normally quickly become tiresome. This is often a technically masterful AAA experience, but with that does come a lot of the same follow the dotted line mentality that bogs down a lot of similarly big budget titles. You know, the idea that what we made is more important than what you do within it. It's a heavily guided tour of Final Fantasy VII, but it often feels very much like a look but don't touch affair. Not only do these scenarios feel irritatingly padded at times, they draw some unquestionable similarities to games like 13 and 15, far more than they do to a traditional Final Fantasy experience. This is stuff many fans of older Final Fantasies outright hated about those titles, and I am genuinely interested to know how they react to these things, why it was terrible in those games but fine here, once they actually get their hands on it. You know, at least 15 let you stop the car to go explore if you wanted, and that's something that just doesn't happen here. But this is partially why I'm so torn, because even in those long stretches where it felt like I was watching a particularly slow anime rather than playing a game, it's not like I didn't feel a sense of purpose within that, like there wasn't method to that madness. I've seen a lot of talk about how alive this world feels, and I get it. These environments, that were originally backdrops essentially, that left a lot to the player's imagination, are now fully rendered. But what actually stuck out to me during my playtime, and where I believe those lengthy corridor crawls actually contribute to the game's themes of environmentalism, activism, and the moral spectrum that encompasses, is how these stretches force you to fully confront the decay and decomposition of this world rather than any kind of vibrancy. Any vitality this world has is completely artificial, the cogs turning to keep this life-sucking machine going while everyone else in the world remains in a kind of stasis in the slums below. The long travels you take force you to witness firsthand this desolation that has swept not only the land, but its denizens. The often panicked NPC dialogue you hear as you run past these people, whether they're trying to survive a catastrophe or pick up the pieces in its aftermath, becomes so cacophonous at times that it can be hard to focus on the conversation you're having with the character ahead of. 
These are all people, all with their own lives, all directly affected by your actions. They all come to different conclusions about how they should deal with the oppression that befalls them, but they remain paralysed under it nonetheless, their inability to come to a consensus stopping everyone dead in their tracks, while the corporation above everyone gets to keep on corporating. Despite the corny nature of both the dialogue and voice acting, this, surprisingly, is how you construct a world with character, even if the walls guiding your way through it are narrow and distinct. And you know, despite the original game's cartoonish look, it's really that bleakness that forms a large part of that game's character in my head. My childhood brain remembers an industrial sheen awash with bright lights, but it's also a world defined by its grime, its decay. The remake does a fantastic job of capturing this duality, of making you realise that one is the direct result of the other, even if the line between the more thematically relevant corridor crawls and the ones intended purely to pad out the remake's fractional story relative to the original can be a blurry one. But within that story, a lot of the moves the developers made to flesh out the events covered read as incredibly intentional and sincere. They add nuance to these characters, some of which previously had very little, and the time you get to spend with people like Barrett see your perception of them alter in slight ways over time. His speeches about the righteousness of your cause come across as brash and melodramatic at the start, but there's a moment where things change slightly. He's saying largely the same things, but the gravity of his words intensifies the more you experience the evils of this world firsthand. After everything you've been forced to look at, how could you not believe what he's saying? That said, a lot of the other ways they stretch the game out go completely against that confidence I talked about earlier. It's in things like the crazy backtracking you're forced to do through the game's less remarkable environments. It's the chapters focused mainly on the game's nothing -y side quests. It's in the length of those animations I mentioned previously. All fat that could be trimmed to streamline this experience, and all contributing to that feeling that the devs were worried about leaving things on too much of an anticlimax, given that there is so much story left to remake here. And the conclusion that results from that? I can't say anything about it, and I won't, but take what you will from the tone of my voice right now, and again, I'm fascinated to see how fans of the original react to this. Let's just say the choices this game makes can be incredibly hit and miss. At the end of the day, I think you can see how torn I am on this weird, weird thing. I'm kind of astounded that it exists, but I'm left wondering who it's really for. I guess reviews seem to be proving otherwise, but it's been hard for me to imagine fans of the original, sans hype or anything else, coming away from this complete overhaul in terms of both story and mechanics, thinking this is 100% what I wanted the remake to be. I also imagine newcomers to Final Fantasy VII looking to see what all the fuss is about are going to be left pretty confused when they get to the end of this thing and have a whole bunch of dangling threads that, honestly, we have no idea when or if they will ever be tied up. I enjoyed my time with Remake All Told, it sets the scene well enough, but I can't shake that feeling that judging the success of the now released Final Fantasy VII Remake will be a process that necessarily continues for many, many years to come. So I hope you enjoyed this review of Final Fantasy VII Remake. Thank you to Square for providing press code, and I'd also like to thank my patrons for their support during this incredibly strange time. Your continued support is what allows me to keep making videos, and I can never thank you enough for that. If you feel like you can, and only if you feel like you can, you can get things like early access to ad-free, sponsor-free video uploads by heading to patreon.com slash writingongames and pledging only what you feel comfortable with. I am immensely grateful for your support in whatever form it takes, and you are directly helping me continue make the show. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsyuk, Leia Cinello, Constantino Sakinis, Henry Milek, Edward Clayton Andrews, Hebe Amori, Rob, Bryce Snyder, Tommy Carver Chaplin, David Burke, Lucas, Dallas Keane, My Dad, Timothy Jones, The Nameless Guy, Ham Migas, Samuel Pickens, Shardfire, Anna Pimentel, Justin's Holderness, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching, stay at home, wash your hands, and I will see you all next time.